What is happening everybody? Hope you're doing all right on this Tuesday evening, especially after the disappointment, what felt like a kick square in the testes last night where United dropped points really late on against Southampton and kind of had a bit of a hiccup in terms of our top four race. Um, but we can't dwell on that disappointment too much because we've got another game right around the corner Thursday evening down at Sellers Park against Crystal Palace, which is now, after last night, a must-win game for us. I mean, obviously, we'd have probably wanted to win it anyway. But, no, there is added significance due to last night's result. Uh, but before we get ahead and look into that game, make sure to drop a like on the video and hit that subscribe button. And let me know down below if you still think we'll get top four. Because top four is still in our hands despite last night's disappointing result. Uh, we have to put it into a bit of context. Like I say, it is still in our hands. We have actually made ground on the likes of Leicester and Chelsea. You both lost at the weekend and we drew, so we made made a point on them. And now we're actually level with Leicester and our goal difference is much, much closer to theirs. So, despite the disappointment, we are still in a position that I think all of us would have given our right arm for back in February because nobody thought we'd be within the touching distance of the top four with three games remaining. And it's full credit to Ollie and his, Ollie and his tricky reds that the unbeaten run, that's exactly what has done. And speaking of the unbeaten run, despite the draw, we have actually extended that now to, to, nine, uh, to 18 games unbeaten, which means that it's, it's 13 wins, five draws. The draws are the things that's killed us all season, 11 of them in the Premier League and that's what we need to change if we are going to challenge for titles and the like down the line. But, like I say, despite the disappointment from last night, there are still some positives to take. One of the main positives I thought was Anthony Martial. Anthony Martial has looked fantastic since the, uh, I want to say since the lockdown, but it's really ever since Bruno Fernandes came in because them two seem to have really hit it off. I mean, you remember back at the, the game against City where it was uh, Bruno Fernandes supplying Anthony Martial to get that opener. And they just seem to be on such such a similar wavelength and, and Fernandes' introduction into the side seems to have really perked Anthony Martial up. I've never seen Anthony Martial smile as much in these last three months, as I have done the previous three and a half years, he's been here. So you can tell that he's enjoying football at the minute. For the first time in what feels like maybe since his first season, he seems to have finally now finally grown into that centre-forward role and he's really started developing this season. And that was highlighted last night as well as the last couple of weeks where he was doing things that we didn't really, we don't really expect from Anthony Martial. I mean, last night he made four recoveries. The other night he made something like three or four recoveries as well against uh, Aston Villa. So it's showing that his work, his work off the ball, which he gets criticised so much for, he is developing and improving. And not only that, his, you, you saw in his role in Marcus Rashford's opener last night. That is some excellent centre-forward play. To get the ball into feet, to have the strength and ability to hold off uh, at least one, maybe even two centre-halves and then the awareness to play it into Rashford to just knock the ball to his right-hand side. Uh, unbelievable. Considering that he's, we've never seen him do that before, ever, in a United shirt, that that really, it really lends itself to, to how much how much work he's been doing on the training pitch with Ollie and the coaches and what have you. And fair play to Martial because he has been a revelation since the, uh, especially since the lockdown, um, really has been. And then the goal he took, showing that he's not only just supplying goals, he's now rifling them in. That goal from last night was Thierry Henry-esque. The way he cuts in, drives at the defence, and then the finish is just top, top, elite level finishing and fair play to Martial because he has developed into, I think he's finally developing into that centre forward that we all hope he could have become. So looking forward to seeing more of that on Thursday evening against Crystal Palace because I think we might have to depend on the likes of Martial and Marcus Rashford to get us over this line and get us that top four, especially this week against Crystal Palace. Uh, but along with Martial, speaking of him, the development 
and the, and the sort of relationship between him and Marcus Rashford was another really good thing to see last night. I mean, it's been, been developing all season, really. Um, and you could even argue a couple of years prior to Alexis Sanchez coming in, the worst bit of transfer business any club has ever done, ever. But getting back on track, Rashford and Martial really seem to be having this sort of competition. Last night, they both scored their 21st of the season and they've had such a prolific season as a partnership, they've actually become United's most prolific partnership ever up front. So that means the, the, the goals that each of them score and the goals that they actually provide for one another, it is more than any other strike partnership, certainly in the Premier League, for United, which means that it's better than York and Cole. Now, we all rave about how good York and Cole was on the same wavelength. We all, we've all seen the goal against Barcelona uh, in the new Camp. This is statistically a better partnership than that. So that is unbelievable considering at the start of the season we were all debating and hope and doubting whether either of them could actually be that goal scorer that we need to lead the line. And they are both doing it and both doing it in spades and hopefully that continues against Crystal Palace. But another thing to note from that game against Southampton that I want to see against Crystal Palace is rotation because against Saints we looked, especially in the second half, we looked leggy. Now, bear in mind, Ollie's gone with the same side for the last five league games on the bounce. And I think that it's it's taken its toll a little bit on one or two players. We saw it in the second half, like I say. Uh, well, in fact, we saw it all game, really, with Paul Pogba not looking himself. I don't know if that's because of fitness or because Southampton pinpointed him. We saw it with Bruno Fernandes. We've seen it a couple of times with Bruno now um, against Southampton and even against Villa. Uh, despite him still chipping in with the goods, his all-round game, I don't think, was at it last night. And it wasn't really at it against Aston Villa. So I'm debating whether he needs a bit of a rest as well as Paul Pogba. So it's going to be interesting to see how we rotate. Because I, th I don't think it's a question of if. I think it's a question of how we rotate. Because at the same stage, while we want to rotate players, we saw what mass rotation did in the game against Norwich for the FA Cup where we looked completely disjointed and just weren't at the races. So I think always got a bit of a, a balancing act in terms of rotating but not making too many changes, which was the case in the FA Cup. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see. A bit of team news for United heading into this game. Um, two long-term injuries, still Phil Jones and Axel Tuanzebe. Doubt either of them are going to play again, at least this domestic season still got a chance for the Europa League at least Phil Jones but as well as them two obviously last night we had a couple of injuries Luke Shaw twisting his ankle which was really really disappointing because the last four three or four games that's the best I've seen Luke Shaw since he moved uh, since pre prior to the leg break that he had in Feyenoord that was the best I've seen Luke Shaw he was getting to the byline he was Whilst he wasn't really chipping in with many assists, he was still causing problems for the opposition, getting into those areas, and it drags other players away as well, so it allows other players a bit of space as well to do things. So I really hope that this injury to Luke Shaw isn't a serious one. I do expect him to probably miss Thursday's game against Palace, but hopefully, hopefully it's nothing more serious than a little bit of a precaution to just rest him and take him out of the fiery line, because we know how much of a struggle it's been for Luke Shaw to get back to this level. So hopefully he doesn't miss too much more football. And also, Brandon Williams, the substitute for Luke Shaw, who obviously came off with a nasty sort of cut on his head by the looks of things. Uh, now that could be anything. That could be concussion. Now if it's concussion, you're looking at anything between a week and and several weeks for that to, to, that to heal and, and make sure that it's not not lingering because you've got to be careful with the uh, with the old concussions these days um, as studies have shown so we need to be need to be careful with that so it's going to leave us with a little bit of a predicament in that left hand side of defence so it'd be interesting to see which way we go now obviously there's a couple of routes we can either go with Diego, Diogo Dalot or my preference which would be to bring in Ethan Laird who I know it's a, you know he's young and that's the main re main probably argument against him starting um, but I think he's ready for it. 
I don't think Delo offers enough. We've seen him several times. I don't think Oli fancies him. So I personally would love to see Ethan Laird given a go. But with it being such a must-win game, I'm debating whether Oli... Uh, whether Ollie will just shove, shove him in that quickly. Uh, so, yeah, but remains to be seen which one we go with because I, it's got to be one of them. I know a little bit on Crystal Palace who are down in 14th position in the Premier League under Roy Hodgson and their season's pretty much over, to be honest. They can't get relegated. They, they're not going to be tr troubling the, the sides higher up in the table looking at European places. Yeah, their season's pretty much done and dusted. And that's kind of represented itself a little bit in the results that they've had. Especially since the restart where they've lost every single game since the restart. Uh, most recently against Aston Villa where they lost two goals to nil. And they don't really score that many, to be honest, Crystal Palace. I mean, they've, they've got the lowest goal scorer. They've got, though they are the lowest goal scoring side in the Premier League only scoring 30 goals this season, which is second only to Norwich, who are rock bottom. That being said, while they don't score that many, they are pretty well organised under Roy Hodgson's side, and they are a side that can, on occasion, upset the apple cart. We saw it a couple of weeks ago where they played against Chelsea. Chelsea won 3-2, but on another day that could have easily been three apiece. It could have been much different. I think Palace hit the post late on for an equaliser, so it just shows they can upset some of the big boys than when they go down there to Sellers Park. Obviously, the crowd not being there is a massive blow to Crystal Palace, but hopefully, hopefully, that plays to our advantage and we can come away with all three points. Players that got missing, they've got a couple of long-term injuries in Jeffrey Schlupp, uh, James Tompkins and Gary Cale, all missing. So that's two out of their, you'd, you'd suppose, their strongest back, fire, uh, back line. Uh, and they're also missing Christian Benteke, who got sent off after the final whistle against Aston Villa. So not only did they not score many, the main target man is also out, out suspended as well. We've got to keep an eye on the likes of uh, Jordan Ayew, who's the top goal scorer. But obviously, the, the key player for this Crystal Palace side is Wilfred Zaha, who hasn't had the greatest of seasons for Palace, not up to the same level that he usually does, but he's still a quality player and a player that they will look to win them the game basically and also Patrick Van Arnhol because over recent weeks especially the last couple of games it, it's I've noticed that teams seem to be pushing their fullbacks especially on our right hand side so their left which will be Van Arnhol they seem to be pushing their, their fullbacks really high up um, almost operating as wingers to try and get one on one against Aaron Wambasaka which I don't know if they've ever watched Wambasaka but not many people win in that equation, but that's not stopped uh, sides trying, and they have caused a little bit of issues because of that. So I think we have to look at look out for Patrick Van Arnold. But this is the side I would pick to go against this Crystal Palace side, and hopefully come away with all three points. As I say, there is going to be a bit of rotation, I feel, but it just depends on how much. So I've gone with David Dare in goal, Wamba Saka at right back. I was toying whether to go with Bay for a bit more physicality uh, because. Crystal Palace will look to exploit United from set pieces because, let's be honest, every other team does. Um, but I've gone with Lindelof alongside Maguire. Then at left-back, I've gone with Dallo because I think that's what Ollie will go with. I personally have gone with Ethan Laird. Uh, and when, we, when, when he comes in, people are in for a shock, just how good he is. Then in midfield, I think this is where we're going to see the most changes. I've brought in McTominay and Fred for Pogba and Matic, both of whom... I think will be rested ahead of that game against Chelsea on Sunday. Then I've gone with Bruno just a bit further further forward. I'd have ideally like to have rested him as well, but I think we need somebody who can progress play from midfield into attack. And I think that was a little bit of a blunder on Ollie's part last night against Southampton, taking both him and Paul Pogba off. So I think one of them has to play against uh, Palace on Thursday. So I've gone with Bruno. And then up front, I've just stuck with the same three. Marcus Rashford, much better against Southampton alongside Anthony Martial, who's been in the form of his career, and young Mason Greenwood, who had a bit of a quiet game against Southampton. So hopefully he can get back on the score sheet against Palace. And the player to watch for me is Anthony Martial, who I've raved about already. But with players now potentially having to rest a couple of players 
we might depend a little bit more on some magic from Martial and Marcus Rashford, both of them who seem to now be just bubbling under at a nice time for United and hopefully we can see a few more goals and assists from both of them on Thursday evening. Now, I've got a couple of questions from you lot. Um, new bit of a segment for, the, for these sort of previews, so if you've got, keep an eye on my Twitter uh, for a chance to ask me some questions in future previews. Like I said, the link to that is in the description. So these are some of the questions that I've got off Twitter. Uh, first of all, Joey over on Twitter. How's it going, Joey, mate? You've asked, is this the biggest game of all his managerial career at United, given it's a must-win? Also, what would you do to combat the fatigue the squad has been showing? Well, as far as the fatigue, I think there is going to be some sort of rotation, but I just want Ollie to keep in mind that too much rotation and we didn't look the same animal against Norwich. As far as this being the biggest career, biggest game of for Oli uh, since uh, taking over at United, it's hard to see past Paris Saint-Germain, isn't it, really, as far as biggest one-off game. Uh, but there's no doubt about it, this is a huge game in terms of United's season. A lot is riding on this on Thursday, and hopefully we can come away with all three points. Uh, Sam, United TV, um, over on Twitter, has asked, should we prioritise this game over the Chelsea FA Cup semi-final? I don't think it's a case of prioritising. I think it's a case of, of just picking the, the best side on the day uh, in terms of fitness as well as quality. Uh, so I think that's going to determine of, of what sort of side he goes with against Palace and on Sunday. Obviously, Sunday would be a great... It, provided we can win on, on Thursday, Sunday could be a really, uh, really big game against Palace. Uh, Graham over on Twitter as well has asked, with the team evidently lacking when Pogba Bruno went off, will this mean both play full 90 as a result with the need for Champions League for United? Now, I've kind of answered this already a little bit, but I uh, I think one of them needs to play because I think we lack so much without both of them, as we've seen when we took them both off in games, as Graham mentioned. Uh, so I do think we've got to go with one of them. I think one of them, I don't want either of them to play night, full 90. Ideally, Bruno plays, we get a couple of goals up by half time, take him off, rest him, and happy days. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't rest both of them. I won't play both of them, put it that way. Uh, and Matty over on Twitter has said, given Williams and Shaw might be doubts for the game, would you play Laird at left back or is it too risky given what's at stake? Um, I've already kind of answered that. I'd personally go with Ethan Laird because I think he's a better, I, th I just think he's better than Delo. I think Delo's been given chance after chance. And especially defensively, really, really lax, in my opinion. And I think Oli doesn't really fancy him either. And it wouldn't surprise me if Delo is out during this summer. But given how big the game is, I'm not sure he'll flung a young Ethan Laird straight back, straight into the side. So whilst I go with Laird, I think he's going to go with Delo as well. Uh, and just one more question I had this time off Reddit, which I've had to write down, uh, from Gorgeous Mandy. Hello. Uh, asking, if if United don't get top four, should we sack Oli? No, we shouldn't. Because even if we don't get top four, I think it's glaringly obvious the progress that Oli's made with this United side. It's Just look at his transfer record as well. I mean, we've brought... We, the, the side now, compared to what it was 12 months ago, or even 14 months ago when we lost to um, Huddersfield and Cardiff, two relegated sides, the side is completely different. The mentality is completely different, and that has to go down as Ollie's sort of uh, all down to Ollie. So you can't sack him just because you didn't get top four. So no, that's uh, no, not not by a long stretch. Um, but as far as the scoreline, I'm going to say United win. Hopefully we do. Um, but I think you know, I, I, I'm confident United bounce back. Um, I'm going to. I think they might scare us because United never do things easy. So I'm going to say I'm going to say two, three, one, three, one to United would be nice. Get a couple of get a couple in front before half time. Rest the boatload ahead of that game against Chelsea. It'd be a really top draw. But let me know your score prediction in the comment section. Also, let me know uh, your team prediction and whether you think United can still get top four. But if you've enjoyed this, bang a like on the video, hit that subscribe button, and I'll catch you guys next time.